A long time ago, you were born. Born in a manger, Lord. Sweet little Jesus boy. Didn't know you come to save us all, to take our sins away. Our eyes were blind. We did not see. We didn't know who you were. You have shown us how to live, and by your grace we're trying. Master, you have shown us how, even as you were dying. This world treats you mean, Lord. It treats me mean, too. But that's how things are done down here. We didn't know it was you. Didn't know you'd come to save us all, to take our sins away. Our eyes were blind. We did not see. We didn't know who you were. That is a great introduction to the glorious gospel of John. One of four gospels in the New Testament scriptures, all of which introduce us to Jesus. To Jesus, to the most important, to the most controversial person who's ever lived. Jesus matters. Us coming to understand who he is and why he came and what we must do in response to this knowledge matters. It matters in many ways, including the reason for which the Apostle Paul states in Acts 17 as he's preaching at Mars Hill this same gospel, and he said this, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to people that all everywhere should repent. We must repent, verse 31, because God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. We're introduced to Jesus in all of his majesty and glory. We're told that he is the one who created all things, John chapter 1, verse 3. And that the uncreated creator himself became a real human, John 1, 14, truly God and truly man, John 1, 1. Two natures, one person. This gospel reminds us that the God-man Jesus was in the world, the very world that he helped fashion, and yet the world did not recognize or receive him. The one who created us and made us in his image for his glory. As the song we just listened to noted, our spiritual eyes were blind. We did not see. We didn't know who you were. The Bible tells us that all of us are helplessly hopeless and hopelessly helpless, that we are all born blind. Physical sight for most, spiritual sight for none. Matthew 13, verse 13, Romans chapter 3. We can't see because we can't see. We are spiritually appraised, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. Or, quote, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, we are darkened in our understanding and separated from the life of God because of our ignorance due to the hardening of our hearts. This is the human condition. This is the, the, the problem that is before us. What we need then is for God in His grace to minister to us individually and personally. We need the Holy Spirit to perform spiritual cataract surgery so that our blind eyes could see, 
that we would look, that we might live. This is what is said in John 3, 14 through 16, that as the serpent was raised in the wilderness, so all the Jews who in faith looked upon that one raised in the wilderness were healed, so it is so that those who look to Jesus and see and believe and receive him are saved. Our eyes were blind, we did not see, we didn't know who you were. Even when God opens our eyes to the glorious light of the gospel of of grace, to a true knowledge of who the true Savior is, as Christians, we still need the work of the Holy Spirit. Not in salvation, but in our sanctification. We are made like Christ as we encounter God and Christ in the word. Sanctify them in the truth. Jesus prayed, thy word is truth. So we need the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit and scripture illumination so that our eyes can see and behold the grandeur and the glory and the beauty and the majesty of Christ that is present in the word of God. For the past few weeks, we have been listening in on the sworn testimony of Jesus, the star witness, the man by the name of John. It is not the author of this gospel, that is John the Apostle. We, of course, are considering the testimony and witness of John the Baptist. If you notice your text of Scripture as you turn to John chapter 1, this is a theme that is repeated here. This is the testimony, verse 19, of John. There's a sense in which all of us are coming to this gospel, considering the most important person, a controversial person who's ever lived, the one whom one day we will one day stand before in judgment. We're considering, who is this Jesus? Why does he matter? How must I respond to him? There are lots of different opinions about Jesus, but there's only one that is an inerrant, infallible, and sufficient, and fully trustworthy and true, and that is that, what, that which is found in the Word of God. So we, in many ways, are being asked here to, as a human jury to consider all of the evidence that is presented, a mountain of gospel evidence that demands nothing less than a saving faith verdict. So as we move out of the prologue into the first narrative section of this gospel, we are coming face to face with the person that Jesus said was the greatest man who ever lived up until that point, a humble man, a prophet by the name of John, John the Baptist. This is the testimony of John, verse 19, verse 32, John bore witness, bore witness of Jesus. Verse 34, he saw as an eyewitness and bore witness of these things. So consider all the evidence, the proof. God's prophet will tell us exactly who Jesus is and why we cannot ignore him, why we mustn't ignore him. John, for a season, was in some ways a a first century celebrity. He was the guy who everybody was talking about. The baptisms, the message, the dress. And so an informal delegation is sent to him from the religious establishment who are wondering why he, on his own, began to preach this message and was baptizing people in the Jordan. These self-righteous, unbelieving religious leaders were were jealous of the popularity of, of, of John. But John wanted them to know very clearly, as we saw last time, that he is not the star attraction that you guys are missing the point. I'm not the main point. I'm not the main event. I'm not the first chair in God's symphony. Who are you? John will tell us very clearly, if you look at verse 20, he confessed and did not deny, and he confessed, I am not the Christ. John had a clear understanding of who he was. He had a very clear understanding of what his purpose in life was. And I reminded you that you will not understand who you were made to be until you have a right understanding of who Jesus is. And so this section is not preserved in the Word of God so much to teach us something about John, though we can learn from his example. The Holy Spirit wants us to consider the testimony, the witness of this man, the witness of who Jesus is. 
For those of you Christians out there, our job, like John, is to call the self-righteous and the impenitent sinners to true repentance. So John's message could be summarized in Mark's gospel, chapter 1, verse 15. He called the crowds to repent, that is, to turn from their sins, to confess their sins, and to believe the gospel. John realized that if one were to receive Jesus, to repent of their sins, that their heart needed to be prepared. Let every heart prepare him room. How do we prepare our hearts for the ministry and message of the King, the Messiah, the Savior, Jesus? It is through repentance. The problem is, is that the terrain of which those whom God has saved, like John, like the Apostle Paul, the terrain by which we venture upon when we go out and bear witness of who Jesus is and why he matters and why he mustn't be ignored, the problem is, is that there's a lot of stony ground as we sow the seed of Christ. A hard heart, Jesus tells us, is like rocky soil. One must repent in order for the soil to be receptive, to respond and to give life, to take root and to flourish. And so the message of the day needed for this generation is the same of that which John preached, that Jesus preached, that the apostles preached, that the other church preached. It is calling self-righteous sinners and unrepentant unbelievers to true repentance. This morning, as we study verses 31 to 34 of John 1, I, I want you to consider this. Why should any person give their life to a man who was born 2,000 years ago? Jesus, 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 Jesus. Only Jesus, every Jesus, always Jesus. All this church is about is Jesus. I was really encouraged the other day. Uh, I was at a high school graduation party, and one of our uh, faithful members was speaking to another uh, individual, telling him about our church, inviting him to our church. They were in the process of looking for a new church. And <laughs> uh, he said, you know, our, 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 our preacher seeks to be clear and accurate and, and bold and unapologetic as he declares the word of God, but he would be the first to tell you that this church isn't about him. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. Why? Why should a person follow a man who was sentenced to die on a criminal's cross? That question may not always be presented to you with those words, but that is the question on the hearts of most, if not all, unbelievers who've heard something about this person, Jesus. I don't want you to take my human opinion, which is worth very little, when we're dealing with a matter of life and death, importance, I want us to listen in now on the testimony of the one who was Jesus' star witness. And what John said, we must do if we're to be saved and to have hope in this life and in the next, is that we must believe and repent. You must repent and believe. We must repent and receive this man, Jesus, in trusting faith. And you say, well, why? And John will tell us why. Number one, he gives us four, four reasons. First reason you must repent and receive this man in trusting faith is because, number one, Jesus is the sin-removing Lamb of God. He is the sin-removing Lamb of God. I've reminded you that the world's greatest problem today is not pollution, carbon emissions. The world's greatest problem today is not systemic racism. The world's greatest problem today is not even cultural Marxism. All of those are merely symptoms. To, to, to just deal with weeds at the surface and not get to the root accomplishes very little. It just gives to us a false sense of everything's all right. If the world's greatest problem was political, God would have sent a politician. If it was 
the distribution of wealth in the economy, he would have sent an economist. But God, knowing better than we do what our greatest problem is, we're our greatest problem. The greatest problem is within us and among us and around us. And that problem, of course, is what? Sin. The problem is intensified by the reality that there's nothing we can do to atone, to pay for our sin debt. What can take away our sin? Nothing but, the, nothing but the blood of Jesus. We could try to live our best life now, but ultimately that would still fall short of God's holy standard. Our righteous deeds in the eyes of, of a righteous and holy judge are nothing more but filthy rags, we're told in the Old Testament. So the greatest problem really only could be remedied in the ultimate solution, in the sending of one, the one who is spoken of here in verse 29. The answer to this world's problems, all of them, marital, family, political, racial, is Jesus. John wants us to know and bore witness of this, that Jesus is the sin-removing Lamb of God. Verse 29, notice the text. Day two, three different days consecutively given, giving us a flavor for the message of John, the man, his motives. Here's day two, a a different audience than day one. The next day, he, that is John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is John's opportunity to join the celestial choir of the angels who joyously declared on that Christmas morning, glad tidings of great joy. The angels who said, this is the significance of the arrival and birth of this one Jesus, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a what? A Savior who is Christ the Lord. Ultimately, this one, as we'll see this morning, was the Son of God. Not so much the Son of Mary and Joseph. And because of this reality, God took it upon himself, God the Father, to name the one who is born of the virgin. And what did God command Mary and Joseph to name this virgin-born son? You shall name him Jesus. Why Jesus? What's in the name? For it is he who would save his people from their Sin. One of the reasons why Christians prioritize corporate worship is because we love to sing praises to our Savior, Lord, and King. Who, in the words of Psalm 103, has removed our transgressions from us as far as the east is from the west. There is a certificate of debt Because God is omniscient, all-knowing. He knows every sin that we have committed. Uh, That will be the basis of a just judgment. But there is a way to escape that condemnation. Because Jesus went to the cross bearing our sins on his shoulders. And for all who would believe in him, Colossians tells us that certificate of debt was nailed to the cross. It is something then we do not have to bear any longer. This is the glorious news of the gospel. This is, this is why we're all about Jesus. It's been said that he who has been forgiven much loves much. And oh, how I love the Lamb of God because he first loved me. You should give your life to Christ, secondly. You should follow Christ. You should bear witness of Christ. Get this, you should worship Christ. Worship. Isn't that reserved for deity alone? 
You should worship Christ secondly because he is the pre-existent one. Number two, he is the pre-existent one. John the Baptist says the very same thing about Jesus that the Apostle John says in his prologue. Absolutely essential. There are many Jesuses presented in this world. Many are counterfeit. The Mormon Jesus, the Jehovah Witness Jesus, the Muslim Jesus, the unbelieving Jewish Jesus. None of them understand this. And it's not just that what truth, truth is not determined by whatever gets the most votes. The truth is the truth, whether you receive it or not. The truth is absolute. The truth is unchanging. The truth is, before becoming human, Jesus existed as the eternal word of God. He was in the beginning with God, John 1, 2. The truth is that we worship one God who exists in three persons, Blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus is the second member of the triune Godhead. Jesus is divine. Jesus is God. He did not become God. He has always existed as God. And if he is God, then he must have no beginning and no end. According to his human nature, Jesus was, of course, born after John the Baptist. But notice what John wants us to know about this Jesus. Jesus is the pre-existent one. Verse 30. This is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank. He's more distinguished, more important. He's greater. He's greater than I. Why? How? For he existed before me. In other words, he has always been. Never was there a time when he was not. Before time, he dwelt in perfect fellowship, harmony, and love with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Again, if you're busy doing the work of evangelism, as Jesus has commissioned and called us to do, you're going to realize that this is going to be a, a point that many will dispute and deny. Why do we worship Jesus? Is it proper to worship a man? Even a mighty good man? Doesn't the Bible tell us in Exodus chapter 20 that idolatry, the essence of idolatry, is to worship anyone or anything above or in place of God? This is a problem for many people of, I can't join your faith because of, in their minds, the blasphemy that you regularly commit. This morning, we, we, we sang praises not just to the Father, but to the Son. This is where the truth of the gospel of John comes in. You need to help people understand, those of you who already understand this by the grace of God, that Christians worship and follow Jesus because, because he himself is an immortal being. He is eternal God. He is unlike all others. He has a higher rank than you and I. He is vastly superior, for he existed, John says, before me. He is not only the sin-removing Lamb of God, he is the pre-existent one. This is why we must follow him, serve him, love him, worship him, tell others about him. Now, one might assume that it seems like, well, John has a pretty good understanding by the grace of God of who Jesus is. You might think, well... He had a full understanding from the moment he began his ministry. And John says, actually, with all humility, that's not the case. By the grace of God, he had a clear vision of who Jesus was. But in humility, John says, I didn't have a full understanding. In other words, unlike the paintings that we see all around us that portray the wrong Jesus, Jesus in the flesh did not walk around this earth with a giant halo over his head. People typically didn't have a problem acknowledging, as some false religions have done after Jesus ascended, his humanity. They knew he was human. His humanness was the easiest thing to grasp. The issue that they had was his deity. And some people say, well, once you know from the halo over Jesus' head that he's divine, that he's a saint. 
That, of course, is just a, a myth. John says, listen, what I'm telling you and calling on you to believe and receive is something that I came to have a deeper understanding of myself. So he has a flashback memory in verses 31 to 33. Look at the text. Verses 31 to 33. Who is Jesus? Why does he matter? Why can't he be ignored? John says, listen, this is surprising. I did not recognize him. I don't think it means that, uh, you know, physically, like, oh, he was, his skin color was different than I thought or his beard wasn't groomed the way I expected. No. I don't fully understand who this Jesus truly was. He says it again in verse 33. I did not recognize him since I did not fully recognize him. Well, what happened? What changed? How do we come to have a, a clearer, fuller, deeper understanding of Jesus? How, do, how have you grown in the knowledge and grace of the Savior? There's some similarity to the way that we grow in our faith in the way in which John grew. Now, his direct revelation came at the baptism of Jesus when the audible voice of God was heard and the Holy Spirit descended upon the one being baptized. Obviously, God, in normal circumstances, his voice is not heard in that manner. But the revelation of God in Christ is heard anytime anybody opens up the Bible and reads. This is why the Holy Spirit has preserved the Bible. This is the pure and perfect, holy, inspired, and inerrant word of God. So John says, verse 31, I did not recognize him, but in order that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. And John bore witness, verse 32, saying, I have beheld the Spirit. Why are we Trinitarian? Because that's who God is. That's who he's revealed to be, himself to be. Jesus in the flesh, God in the flesh is there being baptized. Now they had the Holy Spirit descending as a dove. It wasn't a dove. It was somehow recognized in this unique event of the baptism of Jesus as a dove out of heaven. And it didn't just circle around him. It remained upon him. This is going to give us some level of, of, of something. Something is different and unique about this man. Because the Holy Spirit was operative in the life of prophets, even in the life of those servants who helped build important buildings like the temple and tabernacle. The Holy Spirit would temporarily come on one, we're told in the Old Testament. But this is different. How so? The Spirit descended as dove out of heaven and remained upon him. And he says, verse 33, still I did not recognize him. Not fully. We can be sometimes a little bit thick in the skull, so to speak. Other times it just has to do with the, the, the wonders of these glorious realities are so majestic that God just has to make it so clear for us to be willing to receive, to believe, as it were, the unbelievable. Verse 33, I did not recognize him. The him is Jesus, but he who sent me to baptize in water. Remember, the Pharisees have a problem. On what authority are you starting up your own itinerant ministry and baptizing people? We didn't authorize it. He didn't need authorization from the leaders of Judaism. Why? Why? Because he was sent by God, John 1. Verse 6, there came a man sent from God whose name was John. John had commissioned, God had commissioned this man to be the forerunner of the Messiah. Verse 33, look at the text. The problem with people today is they don't understand ultimately what life is about. 
they're not prepared for eternity because they don't recognize Jesus. I did not recognize him fully either, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom the Holy Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Verse 34, and I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Again, I just need to remind you that he didn't walk around the streets of Jericho with a halo over his head. Matter of fact, for the first 30 years, Jesus lived a mostly uneventful, albeit sinless life. He was raised in not in New York City, but in Nowersville, Nazareth. And he happened to be the, the son of a carpenter. You say, well, John, you seem to have a pretty clear understanding and, and a deep conviction of, about all things Jesus. And John says to you, listen, I came to have a clear and more full understanding of Jesus. That happened in part in the events that surrounded his baptism. Let me just remind you of, of how the, the Gospels speak of this. Turn to Matthew chapter 3 for a moment. This is a few books back. First Gospel in our copy of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 3. All of the Gospel accounts tell us about the baptism. It was, it was a landmark event in the history of redemption. And what do we learn about the baptism of Jesus? And why would John baptize Jesus and not the other way around? That seems strange. John thought the same thing. Verse 13, Matthew 3. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. And John did what I would do. He tried to prevent him. This isn't right. I may not know you in your fullness, but I know that you're greater than I. I'm the best man. You're the leading man. You're supposed to be the promised one, the chosen one. This is the... He says, I try to prevent him saying, I have need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Verse 15, but Jesus answered and said to him, permit it at this time. For in this way, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus says, you have to baptize me because one of the purposes of Christ coming and not just living a week and dying on the cross was he came as a man born under the law to fulfill the law for us who have violated God's law and cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things that are written in the law. So Jesus in his perfect holiness was baptized that we might receive a perfect robe of righteousness as our covering, that God might be both the just and the justifier of anyone and everyone who believes. But the part that John gets to is verses 16 and 17. And after being baptized, Jesus went up immediately from the water. Never has this happened in the history of baptism since. This is unique, an unrepeatable event. Because there's only one like Jesus. He went up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened. And John the Baptist saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and coming upon him. And behold, a voice out of heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And John says, This was a confirmatory sign. This was a sign from heaven trying to help me understand the significance of, of who Jesus is and understanding more so why he came, what mission he had come to fulfill. Until the first service when I was a teenager, there was a song that came out that said, I saw the sign, I saw the sign, I saw the sign, and it opened up my eyes. I don't even know what they were, what our eyes were being opened to in that song, but the eyes that were being opened to for John here was a fuller comprehension of who this Jesus is. He is, without question, this affirmed and confirmed that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. You say, well, what does the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit have to do with the Messiah? Well, if you knew the Old Testament well as first century Jews did, you would know exactly what's being connected to here. 
The permanent anointing of the Holy Spirit was further proof that the one that John baptized is the long-awaited king. Listen to what Isaiah said concerning the future Messiah. Isaiah chapter 11, I'll just read it for you. 700 years before the arrival of Jesus, Isaiah said this. This is a messianic prophecy. Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. Jesse, of course, connected to David. Jesus is the son of David and his human lineage. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. And then this. Here's going to be a sign to you that the Messiah is in your presence. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and strength. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The Holy Spirit I saw come down and it remained on him. This helped me to more fully come to see and believe that Jesus is exactly who he will soon claim to be that he is prophet, priest, and king, that he is, the word Messiah means anointed one. What was Jesus anointed with? It isn't speaking predominantly of anointed with water. He was anointed with the Holy Spirit so that everything he did would be in complete harmony with God's will for the Messiah. He would be empowered, guided, led by the Spirit, the Spirit in all his fullness. In other words, what John is telling us here is he said, everything my parents told me about Jesus was confirmed. It was confirmed when I was there at his baptism when the first member of the Godhead, the Father, declared this is who Jesus is. It was confirmed when the third member of the triune Godhead came down and rested upon him and remained on him. Friend, when you are out in the world busy doing the work of evangelism, going into the world and preaching the gospel, Matthew 16, 15, calling sinners to repent and believe in Christ, many times they're going to ask you, well, why should I? Some will say, you know what? My life's pretty good. You say, well, you don't even know what a full life looks like. Why should I give my life to Jesus Christ? Why should I surrender all? Well, because, number one, he's the sin-removing Lamb of God. Verse 29, number two, because he's the pre-existent one. Number three, as we've seen, thirdly, Jesus is the permanent recipient and dispenser of the Spirit. This can only be said of one person. Jesus. Jesus is the permanent recipient and the dispenser of the Spirit. You say, well, John was a pretty big deal. Humanly speaking, that's true. Jesus said John was great. He was great because of his humility. He was great because of his faithfulness. He was great because of his boldness. But John said... Jesus is greater. The Bible says Jesus is the greatest. The reason why we follow Jesus and not Muhammad, Jesus and not Buddha, is because of this testimony of who Jesus truly is. When you compare John the Baptist with Jesus, as verse 33 does, you'll note that John baptized his followers with water upon their repentance. But John says, <laughs> you think that was something? Jesus baptizes his followers with the Holy Spirit upon our conversion. You know what people say all the time? I need help. I can't make it on my own. I can't do it on my own. Unbelievers say that in a different sense, and they're right. And believers say it. You know what the Bible tells us? Jesus says, I have good news. 
Help is on the way. Help is on the way. He doesn't call the National Guard of holy angels. He gives us something better. He pours out on all who believe on him, not a baptism of water, but a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Look at John chapter 7 for a moment. John chapter 7. You need help? You need a helper? Yes. You need the Holy Spirit. You need the spirit of power. You need the spirit of holiness. You need the spirit of understanding. You need a spirit of love. You will not receive the Holy Spirit if you do not receive Jesus. John chapter 7, verse 37. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out. He wants everybody to hear this. If anyone is thirsty, he's not talking about physical water. He's talking about what the songwriters say. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I don't know why I feel hollow and empty. Even when I get what I work so hard to get or I have some female conquest or whatever it might be. It's like these are, all these things are broken cisterns. I try and I try and I try and I try and I can't get no satisfaction. If any man is thirsty, what do we need to do? Verse 37, let him come to me and drink. What are you talking about? Verse 38, he who believes in me, whoever believes in Jesus, as the scripture said, here's what will happen, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Boy, that sounds refreshing. Rivers of living water? What are you talking about? I'm going to be flowing up within you. Look at verse 39. But this he spoke of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified on earth. You don't understand this truth, you're not going to understand why Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 is such a monumental event in redemption. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit on all who believe in Christ. Not only was the Spirit of God remaining on this one, proving that he is the the Messiah, but he also is the dispenser of the Holy Spirit. Only Jesus can give you that, the help that we so desperately need. So this is the question. This is the question of all questions. This is the question if people aren't thinking they need to be thinking. Most of the time they probably are. They're just not saying it in these words. Why should we repent and entrust ourselves to Jesus? We know the message of the gospel is repent and believe in Christ. That's the message on the Baptist, the message of Jesus, the message of the apostles, the message of the early church, and the testimony of the church for 2,000 years. Why? Help people understand this. Number one, because he is the sin-removing lamb of God. If that's not enough for you, he is the pre-existent one. If that's not enough for you, he is the dove bearer and the Holy Spirit dispenser. And finally, finally, verse 34, because he is none other than the Son of God. He is God, very God. He is the Son of God. In other words, what the Father proclaimed audibly at Jesus' baptism, thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. This is the climatic closing testimony of John the Baptist. Jesus, without question, unmistakably, is the unrivaled Son of God. Why is that important? Because there's no salvation apart from that confession. John 20, 31, I wrote this gospel. This Holy Spirit said we need a fourth gospel. Many other signs that Jesus performed in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might come to have eternal life in his name. You say, well, in a nutshell, what is this all about? What's the significance of this flashback to the baptism? What does all of this mean? It means that the one standing in John's midst is our Lord and Savior, That Jesus is the prophesied Messiah. We have to understand who the sweet little Jesus child. We didn't know who you were. We need to know 
so that we can see and be saved, so that we can look and live. There's a lot of opinions about Jesus, but there's only one perfect revelation about him. It is here in the word of God. It all comes back to Jesus. Everything comes back to Jesus. Everything of any importance comes back to Jesus because there is only one person in the universe who can pardon our sins and dispense the spirit of holiness. Who's that? Behold, the Lamb of God. Some of you are running, but you're running in the wrong direction. Come to him. Come to him. Confess that you're a sinner. Acknowledge what your conscience tells you to be so. And receive a full pardon. Receive the forgiveness of sins. Jesus is the Son of God. Therefore, entrust yourself to him. Entrust yourself to his lordship. Receive him as your redeemer and king. Jesus, there's no one like you. For those of you who have already come, who have already, by the grace of God, received him, may the true church of Jesus Christ continue to love Jesus, follow Jesus, worship Jesus, obey Jesus, and bear witness of Jesus all the days of our life. This is the second day of the clear and powerful testimony of the star witness to Jesus, Son of God. Father, we thank you for the clarity of your word. We thank you for the spirit who did a work in our hearts to remove the blinders from our eyes so that we could see. Father, we pray for people to respond to your spirit and to repent and to believe in Christ to escape the wrath that abides over them and all who choose to go their own way and to pay their own sin debt. How foolish, how foolish for anyone to face eternal wrath and hell when you are willing to send a perfect lamb to remove sin. Jesus, we love you. We're indebted to you. We ask that you'd help us to be more committed in a time of great fear and uncertainty. To tell folks about the, the anchor that we have, the anchor of hope, hope in this life, hope in death, hope for today and for tomorrow. Lord, help us to tell people about Jesus. Lord, the true Jesus. We thank you for the opportunity that we have on the Lord's Day together as his body and to celebrate his love and this great salvation he provided for us freely through his work on the cross and his empty tomb. All these things we pray to you, Father, in his blessed and holy name. Amen.